Thank you so much, Danielle and Elijah. What a blessing that was. <laughs> Time now for our scripture reading. It's taken from Joel 2, 28 and 29. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. May God add a rich blessing to the reading of his word. It's our privilege now to invite to the pulpit Joshua Lewis, who uh, has been mentioned has been in Cambodia. He told me about half his life. He's on about a six month furlough right now. He said about every two years, normally it's not six months, but because they had their little daughter who's about 11 weeks old now, uh, they had an extended stay. So welcome Joshua. Thank you. And thank you, Danielle and Elijah for that song. Um, the country that I come from, no one has ever seen a piano before. So that's a, that is a privilege for me to hear that because I, um, I miss the singing and praising God through the, through, um, that we have here in the States. Um, we don't even have a church. We just meet in our home or in members' homes. And the people group that we are reaching are called the Cham people. In the Adventist Frontier Missions magazine, they call it the Great River People Project because it's along the Mekong River, which as you have already heard, um, can not stay in its banks very well. Um, I want to, uh, so the Great River People are Cham, they are Muslims. They speak a different language than the rest of Cambodia. And so we're doing completely brand new work there. And my goal in the next year is to start working on a hymnal, start translating some of the songs that we have. They've never heard Jesus loves me, this I know in their language yet. It's, it's brand new. There's been four Cham baptisms and that's not very many, but uh, it takes four to get to eight and it takes eight to get to 16. So uh, we're glad that um, we've, accomplish what we have and the Cambodian church is what my family were uh, be, when my family went in 1995 we worked with John people and Cambodian people everyone was unreached back then now the Cambodian church has several thousand uh, members and there's five or six ordained ministers and there's um, the Bible in the Cambodian language and there's Adventist hymnal, um, but it doesn't sound like our hymns in, in, uh, in, uh, that we're used to with the piano and four part harmony. Can I uh, sing a tiny bit of what a Cambodian hymn would sound like? This song is titled, um, Why Wouldn't You Praise, Why Wouldn't You Serve God Because His Grace is Sufficient for You? แหน่งสายคมลางเรือไอ้มันชีปันไทยมันบ่มราแปรหึมันบ่มราแปรหึแหน่งสายคมลางเรือไอ้มันชีปันไทยมันบ่มราแปรหึคุณตรง <Sanly> And they hold the um, consonants where we hold the vowels. So that's the ng sound that they're that they're um, anyway it, there's nothing that would prepare prepare us when i was seven years old my mom and dad came back from afm as flying to be missionaries and they said we're going to cambodia and they sat my sisters and i down 
on the living room floor and we got out a globe and we looked for Cambodia. And it's not in South America, it's not in Africa. Cambodia's, uh, if my head was the globe and this ear was America, this ear is Cambodia. It's all the way as far as you can go. And my uncle, my mom's brother, my uncle Steve said, what, you're taking your children there? Don't you know they have mosquitoes? He said, your children are gonna be kidnapped by mosquitoes. And we didn't know what it would be like when we open, when the plane op door opened, it felt like the oven when you've just baked a pie and that warm air hits your face. And they pushed the uh, staircase up to uh, the side of the plane and we walked down. And I remember thinking, I don't, I never knew air could get this hot. Cambodia doesn't have four seasons. Um, this is the flag of Cambodia. It has Angkor Wat Temple, which is the largest religious structure ever made on earth. It's taller than any cathedral in Europe. Um, it's one of three or four ancient structures visible from orbit, what some are the Great Wall of China, the pyramids, and Angkor Wat Temple. Uh, it's all carved of stones, huge stones, and it was about 500 years after Jesus' time. And Cambodian civilization had a, a great start, uh, but they've had a rough time. And when we were there, we used to find on Sabbath afternoon walks, human bones because of the killing fields that happened. Many people had stepped on landmines and I remember as a kid acting out different animals. We would go like this and my mom would say, oh, you're a, a, an elephant. And one day my sisters and I stood on one foot and she said, are you a flamingo? And we said, no, we're Cambodians because so many of them used a prosthetic leg or something like that. This is my family on the steps to our house. Uh, we left in January 95, I believe. And my little sister who is two years old is a Cambodian at heart because she, when we went back on a furlough when she was five years old, it was like meeting her relatives for the first time because she didn't remember them. Uh, this is a Cambodian minivan. I think there's nine or 10 on there. My family did the same thing. This is the yard where that flood came in above our heads. Um, the well where my mom did laundry by hand um, and brought water out on a bucket, on a rope. Uh, our first four-wheeled vehicle was probably left over from the Vietnam War. That's my mom and my dad and my sisters and I all crowded in. When that Jeep fell in half, we got this Toyota truck and we drove it like a wheelbarrow. Um, the roads were so bad through the jungles and the biting flies were so bad, everyone wanted to ride in the cab because if you're in the cab, it was squishy, but if you were out, you're getting bit by flies. And we would get stuck when we saw the logging trucks come through because they would help us with their winches. This is a church outing, um, Sabbath afternoon, picking up people for church. And that truck went from my family, we left in 2000 through uh, Emmanuel and Carla Lefevre, and they used it in Ratanakiri, which is a province so hard, it's harder than getting to the moon probably. And um, after that, uh, Brian um, uh, Braden and Johanna Pewitt used it uh, for a province near the Vietnam border where there was no roads and they had a winch and they would tie it from tree to tree going up and down the mountains and take several um, days to get there. And it's retired now, but I use it around the yard for um, some work. And here I'm picking up roofing 10 meters long on a five meter long truck. And I learned to water ski behind it in the uh, rice field uh, irrigation canals. And I also learned to um, get out of the water as soon as I could to make check for leeches. And there would be water buffaloes in there and you would 
you couldn't tell until you're right there because only their tip of their nose sticks out above the water and their, and their eyes and you would say oh and swerve around this is my family uh my wife stephanie and my son nathan um, this was just a few months ago right before our daughter was born uh, stephanie sends her greetings she's um, got a little girl with a fever and uh, we're just too much traveling so she didn't come today but um, this is Alyssa, who is the newest uh, missionary in our family and um, this picture is a little bit of furlough that's my mom right there and i'm meeting two of my nephews and one of my two of my nieces that i've never met before and they're meeting cousins that they had never met before and both of my sisters had never met my son before. And um, so you can see the mom, I smile on my mom's face, having all her grandkids and nieces and nephews in one room, just um, how excited she is. And the great, the great river people or the Cham people. So the Cham are 400,000 Muslims in Cambodia. Cambodia is a Buddhist country but the Cham people are a minority that speak a different language that are, are Muslims. And this is um, one of their kids. This is the team that we have there uh, in the foreground are Carly and Eric Tirado. Carly is half Cambodian and she always had a dream to uh, become a nurse and go back to Cambodia and serve uh, the country where her father was from. And they have a little boy uh, and there's my wife and I, and we had two student missionaries from Canada last year that, that are uh, in the back. And so right here you see our village along the river. One side is the river, one side is the flooded rice fields. And when it comes up, it's nothing but rooftops and treetops. In the rainy season, you forget there ever was a dry season. In the dry season, you forget there ever was a rainy season. Uh, here's some boys playing uh, volleyball under their house. You can't even see their house because of the, the stilts. They'll have stilts up to 20 or maybe 25, sometimes 30 feet tall, and they have ladders. In fact, the Cambodian invitation to come into your house is not come in, it's come up. They say, come up to, into my house because there's a long staircase or ladder to get in. Uh, this is a mosque barely above the, the water line. Now this school um, is up to the windows. And when, it, when the water comes up, the animals find your house as a place for high, high ground. And my wife's got bitten by a scorpion. I've got bitten by centipedes. Um, and the ants, when they are trying, the ants live in the ground. When the water floods, they each take a small white suitcase and carry it with them, which is they each get one egg and they carry it and they, they move to the rafters of your house till the water goes down. Cambodia is maybe 200 years behind America. They're still using the covered wagons, <laughs> uh, but they do have a smartphone. So they're driving their, their uh, water buffalo and, and on Facebook. So one of the things that we have been opened our eyes to it during COVID time is it's hard to meet up with people. Sometimes they put ropes in front of their yard so people don't come in. Um, I, as a foreigner, I was looked on with suspicion because there was little transfer between, um, between uh, locals, but there was from coming, uh, other people coming in. So I could only shop at people that knew me and knew I lived there, but, I've been shopping sometimes and I could see what they wanted and they said, we don't have that. Um, try over, try down that way. <laughs> and so our cows and water buffaloes, they live together under the people's houses. You see the stilts of their house and their cows are tied right there. Um, this is a delicacy in Cambodia is the they make cracker out of the burned rice at the bottom of the pan and uh, the bible in Cambodia says man does not live by rice alone they eat rice three times a day 
And this is uh, the clay pot salesman pulling behind his motorcycle. Um, it's the loudest thing on the road because these motorbikes are so old, they don't even have the original part, parts anymore. It's all been replaced. And the mufflers are the first thing that they, they let fall off. Here are the factory workers making the clothes that you wear. If you see made in Cambodia, Nike, Gap, whatever brands that they are, um, those people worked for one month to earn $150. Um, and they would have had to work several days to buy one of the shirts that they make and they're, if they bought it at US prices. And they're making that at um, very hard conditions. They still use um, horse carts. This is my neighbor getting wood freshly milled from a chainsaw in the jungle. There's no Home Depots here. Later I'll have pictures of uh, some of the stores. There's a, a load with bamboo and two motorcycles on the top. This is uh, scarecrows to keep the COVID away. And when COVID started, everybody made scarecrows and put them in their front yards, thinking that that would help. And behind this scarecrow, which has a motorcycle helmet for a head, is a spirit house. Um, we just finished Halloween, where uh, America has. Um, for some reason has a, an effect, uh, infatuation with um, ugly things. In Cambodia, they feed the dead every day, but they don't put skeletons up and, and ghosts and stuff like that. I don't know, you know, they believe that in the afterlife, so they, they think their dead relatives need some food. So they have a little house that they come to. Um, this is our property, and this property is far enough away from the river. We've never had floods here. My wife and I just uh, were praying about it, and we were led to this area. And uh, later in the, the pictures, I'll show you a picture of the people who sold, sold this house to us. Uh, the lady that sold it has been baptized. This is her father. We were driving along and praying, uh, her father with my son, Nathan. We're driving along and praying and looking for a place to, to build our home. And the top of every hill had a Buddhist temple. Um, I don't know if you remember in the Bible, they said the high places, they had altars on the high places. That's the Cambodian religion too. So there's no way we could have a home there. And we drove along and we found um, a place that was a little higher ground and we stopped at in front of this home after praying and to ask them if they knew anyone that was selling land around there. And they were so friendly. They said, we have been watching the World Cup soccer and we have been seeing all the flags of all the different countries and just want, wanting to meet someone from another country. And then you stop by. They said, it's just like angels coming to visit us. You're so welcome. And they had heard of our work bringing patients to the clinic and various things. And when they heard we were looking for land, they said, don't look any further. My daughter will sell you half of her land across the street from us. We want you to live by us. And the land had 150 mango trees. And you've never had mango until it stained your mouth yellow and it dripped down your elbows and made pools of mango juice on the tile floor in your kitchen. Uh, so there are very many blessings to uh, mission life. Um, and there's a trial, one of them is the bugs that come in our house. This is one evening of bug wings. Uh, when, it, when they decide that's the night to come out, uh, it's not every night, but certain nights they come out. If it, the rain is right and the weather is right and the moon is right, they'll come out. We have to clo close all the doors, turn off all the lights and just be in darkness because their favorite thing to do is to find a light. And it takes weeks to sweep up the, uh, the, their, their um, wings. This is uh, our property drilling a well. And what you're looking at is where the rubber of your car tires comes from, any kind of latex. This is a rubber plantation. Uh, and it's very young trees, so they're not being tapped right now. Um, 
but they cut the rubber tree bark uh, like a candy cane around it and out comes white milky rubber and just in a few hours it dries like latex and you can stretch it um, and it's bouncy you can wind it into a ball and bounce it it's it's natural latex uh, before i left i spent several months making the bricks for my partner's house with a team we made the bricks one by one and this was their house in um, halfway done and this is what it looks like now just um, i know it doesn't look like much but when you made 6,000 bricks one at a time, um, it's really something to me. And I'll show you a little bit of pictures, uh, a few more slides down um, about uh, the brick making process. I just wanna give you an overview of some of the activities we do. We have home churches. So that involves getting up Sabbath, driving to three different villages and picking up whoever's coming. And then we all meet in, in one village together. This is Hemrai. He's blind. You see, I'm leading him by the hand and I've got my yellow boots on uh, because of the mud puddles. And he can't see to go over the mud puddles, so I just carry him over. And uh, this is his home. Uh, it gets knocked down every time the flood comes up because he's right on the riverbank and the current pushes it away. So I remodeled a house that with a leaky roof. This was all my old roofing from my house. And I put a metal roof on my house and I brought all of these um, used building materials and put up his house again. And I'd like to make him a better house one day, but that's all that, that we've had time for so far. And he lives by himself, blind, and he cooks by himself on a wood fire. Sometimes he catches his shirt tails on fire a little bit. Um, and we have helped him get two cornea transplants that helped temporarily. And then he uh, lost his sight again because he has uh, a thyroid problem that um, attacks his eyes too. And so this is one of our home churches. The homes are completely uh, air flowing, open. There's not a, a ceiling or a caulking. Uh, you can see the light shining through the wooden the wooden cracks. So the kids don't wear diapers. If the kid has to pee, they just pee through the floor and hope no one's down there. And then they they take a bucket of water and they they clean off the floor and let it dry and it's as clean as as clean as new. This was a house that Stephanie and I rented. That's her uh, on the right hand side um, with my son, and we're having home church there. It can be from five people to 30 people, depending on uh, schools and uh, the holidays. And the Muslim religion is not a um, religion that's used to Sabbath schools because they're taught to memorize the Quran and recite it in Arabic, which they don't understand. They will memorize the whole Quran so they can say it perfectly. And the Quran is color coded with red, green, blue for what notes, what words to hold out, what, um, when to speed up, when to slow down, so they can recite it exactly the way that Muhammad did, because they believe it's a blessing to say it exactly the way he did, but they don't understand it. And so when we try to get Sabbath school discussions going, um, they're not used to that. It takes several years for them to have an inductive Bible study to say, this is what the Bible means. What does it mean to me? I can uh, apply that. And sometimes there's no one that can read. So if someone that reads comes, I will have them read Bible verses. But if someone that um, cannot read, if no one can read, then I will tell them a Bible story just by acting it out. If it's the creation story, I will show how God formed man out of, out of the, the dirt. And people have never heard that before. This is the newly finished uh, book of Matthew in the Cham language. Um, to me, it looks like some monkey tales. Um, and I cannot read this. And in our province, 
the, some of the people are learning Arabic instead of their own language. So not too many of our people know it, but some other provinces are sticking to their Cham roots. So this Bible will be very useful to them. And we were contacted by Tyndale translators who are working on that to ask if we had any Christians that are willing to come do editing for them. So we sent uh, Gartit in the white t-shirt and his wife. Um, Gartit is the third person baptized, his, his wife is not. And we sent them for two years to work on translating the New Testament. This is some of the church ladies seen my visiting and playing with my son under their houses. It's too hot in the houses. So they stay under the houses and it's just dirt under the houses. So they put a wooden bed, sitting bed to stay on. This is my wife's uh, vegetable market, which is just a dirt floor, but we are very grateful for all the good vegetables that we have. My wife brought this baby home from the hospital with, and, and the mother and the crowds in America, when you have a baby home, you say, please, no visitors for a few weeks. Uh, over there, the crowd just comes. They don't, they don't um, value privacy the same way we do. They are a culture that is all a family. In fact, they don't have the word for sister and brother because older boy or younger boy just is how they say brother. Everyone is brother and aunt or an uncle. Uh, this is a picture of a funeral on the right-hand side of someone that we brought their two-year-old boy to the hospital, but he died while we were um, get, trying to get him into the emergency room. And that's his mother there with a new baby that she had and my wife. Um, and I don't have time to get into all these stories, but I'm just trying to show you a few people um, so that you know who you're gonna meet in heaven because I want it to be a reunion for, there'll be a Cambodian camp meeting and I can invite you guys to come and taste some Cambodian curry with um, peanuts and coconut cream and say, these were the people that bought the building that we had our health classes in. These were the people that paid for us and they're gonna be very grateful and they, and they are. This is our local, um, Barber, uh, uh, seamstress. And um, I want to tell you about uh, this lady and her son. This is Srai Niang and her son Man Manan. Her and her husband have uh, two older girls and, a, and an older boy. And she was the one that welcomed us to, to buy half of her land. And then she had come to church with us one time before her son got leukemia and she had to move to the capital city for almost a year. Uh, and the hospital was so crowded, she slept under the patient bed. And sometimes she was so tired from caring for him that she would pray, God, you have to wake me up if he needs me. And one time an angel, she dreamed an angel was wiggling her toes and her, her boy was too weak to, to ask for something that he needed. Other times, God woke her up when it was time to go to church. And she was reading books that I gave her in the hospital, and a Christian doctor noticed that and invited her to come to church with him. So often over the year that she was in Phnom Penh City at the hospital, she was going to church with her doctor. And we would go visit them. This is outside the hospital walls. They don't allow visitors inside. So she would come out. And her daughter, Mani, is my son Nathan's uh, favorite babysitter. And her son was healed from cancer. And the doctor said it was a one in 10,000 chance. And not only is he healed, but he doesn't need blood transfusions for the rest of his life, as some people often do, because his bone marrow started making the blood cells again all on its own. And so when he was coming home, we put up these balloons and we were waiting to celebrate with him. And her husband was home alone during that time. The older kids were either at school or staying with grandparents. And my wife and I were the only ones that invited him over and gave him leftover food and spent time with him. And he saw our heart serving people. And 
The next picture is uh, bricks that we were bringing to build a clinic. And the reason I have this picture now in the story is because Sarai Niang's husband, who was staying at home while his wife was in the hospital, was a truck driver. And we were building a clinic in a, in a remote place. And we set off with overload of bricks because it was a three, well, it's a three hour drive in a car, but it's a four hour drive in a heavy dump truck. And so we were overloaded and the weight of the bricks made the truck bounce on the bumps and it pinched its own brake line and it made a small hole and it was leaking brake fluid. So we got downtown the capital city of our uh, um, bit province and we we're going through a turn and there was cars coming and he tapped the brakes and there was nothing and he said I have no brakes I said okay drive very slowly and find a station and we can get this work done we drove very slowly we drove to the top of the hill we got on a level place and some of the workers started getting out I was still in the the truck and it started rolling backwards and I started yelling at people, push the truck, try to stop it. And they were trying to look for something to block the tires, but they couldn't find anything. And it started taking off backwards down the hill. So I opened the passenger door and started screaming and get out of the way and motioning with my hands and be behind us. It wasn't a very tall hill, but when you're full of bricks and you're going backwards through traffic, it seemed like it's taking forever. And uh, he couldn't see backwards. So I was telling him, do the left, do the left. I was, no, the other way. And we were violently swerving back and forth across the road and people were running off in every direction. There was a man with a motorcycle trailer, long motorcycle trailer, and his motorcycle was sold and his eyes were about this big. And I was like, hurry, hurry. And my, I lost my voice. I was just yelling air. And uh, he was trying to drive backwards, look, looking at the side mirror, and this motorcycle was kickstarting. And we were getting closer and closer, and he was about to jump off. And I said, No, just hurry, just get it started. And uh, just when we were inches away, it roared to life, and he pulled away, and we just missed him by a hair. And there was phone shops and restaurants and cow carts and bicycles and uh, we missed everything and a crowd started to gather and they started clapping and they said that was a one in ten thousand chance that you wouldn't have hit something and his name is vana and i said let's go vana before the crowd gets bigger or before someone complains and he said i can't move my legs <laughs> He had so much adrenaline when he got stopped, he, he couldn't even move. Uh, he caught his breath and um, we limped along and we found somewhere to get the brakes worked on. So God saved his life and he realized that. And he actually got thrown in jail for a few months um, because he has an anger problem and he got in a small accident with someone and he ended up yelling at the police. Um, and then his wife, who was in the hospital with her son, learns that her husband is in jail. And they had no income during that time because uh, they usually worked together buying cashews and he wasn't able to do very much. And so they sold some of their possessions to give him the, um, to give, to, to pay to get him out of jail. And um, my wife and I have a newsletter where we um, send pictures and you can find updates. My dad is gonna pass out uh, a sign up sheet I forgot earlier. Um, this is for the Adventist Frontier Missions Magazine where we write often for, and uh, also if you just give us your email address, we can send you pictures from time to time. And so um, God is changing Vana. He, used, he, said, he said to me, I used to be a tiger. No one could talk to me. He said, with my wife was gone, no one would come do business with me because I was so mean. And we were a little bit disappointed when we moved there because he was such a mean neighbor. He was always yelling. Um, and he said, now I have a voice in my head that tells me to be, 
to calm down when because I prayed and asked God for help. And he says the simplest, most beautiful prayers. He says, Dear God, my name is Vana. Thank you for saving my son. Thank you for helping my family. That's all I can say. Amen. You know, he he has the most childlike prayers, but God is God is changing uh, his life. And they the property that they lived in, they owed the bank for. And the bank was collecting. They, they had um, gone into foreclosure because they couldn't make the payments while they were in the hospital. And so they were going to sell it and make a hardware store next to our, my house because it's a big wooden barn. And the person that was going to buy it was going to make a busy store, was going to be very dusty. And it's just, um, it's just, stone's throw from our front door where our children play so we prayed about it and god said one day you're going to need that and we put it in the magazine and it barely hit the magazine before it was paid for and then we saw a donation from this church and my wife called you and you cleared your schedule thank you i don't know who was supposed to preach today um but uh this church i'm proud of you guys because we were wondering if we would see someone that we knew here um, because the magazine only looks one direction, but we just want to say, um, keep up the good work. And we know when you focus on mission work that the work at home will never be left undone either. And this is the building that you bought. So it looks like, uh, to me, it looks like a church, okay? It's a A-frame building like this, and it's wooden. It needs some insulation. It needs some other things. Uh, this is health classes. We go asking people. We, we pass out invitations, and we say, come learn about how to drink water. They put energy drinks in their baby bottles. We say, sometimes someone will come to me, I have a terrible headache. And I take the skin on their arm, and I pinch it, and it just stays like that, like Play-Doh. And I, I say, Grandma, if you will drink half a liter of water now and then wait 15 minutes and drink another half a liter, and if your headache doesn't go away, I will pay you $5. I will buy you medicine. And she said, oh, yeah, I haven't drinking anything for today yet. And then she will drink the water, and she said, oh, I, I felt a rush of, um, of sweat come on my body. I felt much better already. And so we are not educated as nurses and doctors, but we know um, growing up in the mission field and some basic education that we are privileged to have in this country. You see in Cambodia, uh, shortly after Vietnam War, there was a strict communist party called the Khmer Rouge. And they wanted to start over with ignorant farmers. So they killed anyone that wore glasses. They, Cambodia had been colonized by the French. Um, they tricked people, say, we need, we have someone from France coming to visit. Anyone that can speak French, we can give them more food or, or some reward. And anyone that would volunteer would never be seen again. Um, so Cambodia is coming from a very ig ignorant time. And we bought Srainiang and Bana's house, which is next to us. And they saw in a dream where they were supposed to go next. They didn't even know it was for sale, but they saw the trees and the grass and uh, the building. And it was um, in a more rural area. So it was cheaper real estate. And they were able to buy it debt free from what we, the price of the house that we bought for the, from them. And, and it's the same size as the one that they had before. And it's right next to the clinic that I had built in a province three hours away. So without, without um, planning, I already planted a sister, a daughter church to our area. And this is their two daughters. Um, and the mother, she was just baptized. Her son, who was cancer-free. Our nurse, Soti, and his wife. My wife and I, Carly and Eric, uh, are two student missionaries. And uh, Gatit, who was is a Bible worker that um, did the Bible translation. This is her baptism. And the man baptizing her 
was my dad's Bible worker, and now he's an ordained pastor. And this is her in front of the Adventist church in our province and, and her son. And she has asked for training in child evangelism. She loves children. Our nurse Soti um, was one of my English students when he was 12 years old. I went as a student missionary to Cambodia and I was there three and a half or uh, almost four years. And then I came back uh, and worked for Adventist Frontier Missions and uh, met my wife who, um, her parents were missionaries for 42 years. And her dad, um, she was born the only white girl in a hospital in Congo, actually a small clinic in Congo, uh, probably on, only white girl that's ever been born there today. And they moved to the island of Papua, the Western Papua, which is part of Indonesia when she was one years old. Uh, her dad was Bob Roberts, who was a uh, general conference aviation pilot there for many years. And so when I was a student missionary, so he was my English student and he was happy and well attentive, but I didn't have a good relationship. I didn't have a strong relationship with him other than seeing him in class but he used to come to my house sometimes because uh, I only found out later because his family life was so bad. He told me um, my friends used to be in their school uniforms going to school uh, with their bellies full and I was trying to keep my mom and my stepdad from killing each other with knives. He said often the police would be called. I was so embarrassed. He said in my life I prayed for two things, to have a family that would love me and that I could become a doctor and help people. And then after I left, God answered both of his prayers. There was two missionary families that came, uh, Jonathan and Veronica Nicolades, who were there after me, and Bo and Kristen Hutchison. And they adopted Soti as part of their family. He did family worships with them, um, went on family vacation with them, and his favorite thing was singing. He loved Christian singing. and um, he can sing, this is the day, and uh, uh, bless the Lord, oh my soul. And um, he's, so he was ready to become a Christian without ever studying at all. And he was the most faithful Muslim. And I know he's going to be the most faithful Christian because he had been raised by some Buddhist relatives and some Christian relatives. So when he became 12 or 13 years old, he said, I don't want to be a Muslim just because the people around me are. And he spent two years diligently studying Islam before he decided it was true. And he's done the same thing with Christianity. And God also blessed, answered his second prayer, which was to become a healer. And Bo Hutchison brought him to medical school in Cambodia. It's $2,000 a year for medical school. And so D, coming from his background, he was an unwanted baby. He was one of those worm belly, naked babies looking for food that fell on the ground that other people dropped when he was growing up. His mom, his dad died at one. His mom left him with relatives to go work in another country, uh, married a new husband. Uh, Cambodian men will never accept the children of another man back into their home, back into the inheritance with their children. That's unheard of. And so, uh, so D was, um, he couldn't imagine $2,000 a month, uh, a year being spent on him. So he told the missionary, I decided I don't want to do it because $2,000 sounded like too much. He, he had never heard of that kind of money. And so he studied on his own, uh, borrowed books, um, photocopied books, and he took an exam to get into nursing school and got a full scholarship. And he called me from nursing school because Bo had left and told him to stay in touch with me. And he said, they're drinking and, and smoking. All, the Cambodians, uh, do a lot of drinking. It flows like a river. Um, and he said, it's, it's hard. I don't 
um, and I don't know what to do. And I gave him a little bit of money for a stipend so he could rent a house and move out of the dorm and be away from the partying atmosphere. And this is Soti's mother at um, his wedding. Uh, this is her wedding clothes. And when I was a student missionary learning the Cham language, his mother was my language teacher because she speaks very loudly. And I like someone that's very talkative. That's the kind of person that you need. And this is Soti and his fiance. Uh, all during COVID time, Soti was engaged to this girl, but in their culture, they can never be together. So I would study the Bible with him under the trees because we were trying to do social distancing. And after that, he would call her and tell her everything that he was learning. And he stood up for the Sabbath. And uh, this is his wife with um, my son, Nathan. Uh, my scripture reading today was Joel chapter two about in the end times we'll see dreams. And she has had three or four dreams. So T has had many dreams. He dreamed he was a Christian evangelist. He saw Jesus in dreams. His wife, her first dream was that she was babysitting my son. And um, the dreams that they had softened their hearts. This is buying the land. And all of these are miracle stories. I'm going to rush ahead because um, I don't have enough time to get to it all. But the way that God brought us to the clinic um, property, this is uh, making the bricks for the clinic. So D was a faithful Muslim fasting for Ramadan, which means from the time the sun goes up till it goes down, he wouldn't even swallow his spit. Any, any liquid in front of his tongue, he had to spit out. So he's working in 100, 100 degree weather. You can see the look on his face. Um, he wants bricks for his clinic, no matter if it kills him. <laughs> And then he would take a break and he would fill the tractor bucket with water and hope the water would soak in through his skin. And we're building his clinic. And this clinic was Soti's idea because he had worked with Bo Hutchison, door-to-door uh, -door ministry, and he had never, health ministry as a nurse, Bo was a nurse, and he had never seen someone love like that. And he wanted to start a clinic as far away from any health services as he could. So he looked on a map, there was a hospital in this province capital and a hospital there. And he went halfway between where it was three hours to one hospital and two and a half the other direction. And he said, this is where I wanna make a clinic. This is what it looks like now. This is his wedding. And I was worried because his wife was still being uh, resistant to, to uh, his beliefs. But she married him knowing that he was spending every waking hour studying the Bible. So I was hopeful. They had a little boy uh, named Mohadeen. This is her, um, what he looks like now. Uh, and Soti and his wife um, are now having family worship together. They send us videos um, of them singing with their little boy. They said, we're trying to do the same thing that we saw you do. And so she had a dream where she saw Jesus and she said it was so real. She didn't know if it was a dream or if it was real. And that was just after Soti had been praying for her that God would soften her heart. And now that we have two kids of our own, we're open our eyes to the, all the kids around us. And we want to start doing uh, children's ministry. And so I'm praying that um, now that we have some young families that we can train them and I'll need to, take time off of uh, building and studying with the men to help my wife have free time to be able to work with some of these ladies. Uh, and I'm just, so those are two stories, uh, Srainiang and her family. Uh, and you saw the picture of her baptism and Soti and his wife, we we're praying that their kids would be the first generation of Cham people that were raised to love Jesus. And I'm just going to give a few pictures and then, um, close. This is the Home Depot I was telling you about. Everywhere we go, people ask us for help. This was my birthday. We're, we're trying to water ski on the Mekong River behind an 18 horsepower fishing boat. And after we were done, people said, we have someone sick here. Can you come see them? So you see, I'm in my swimming suit and um, patients 
that I've transported. This is the emergency room at the general hospital in the capital city on the road waiting to get in. Um, here's a man in our village that I've never seen wear a shirt. And if you look closely, his shoes aren't matching and uh, one eye is missing and uh, he's got a stutter, but he's very friendly. And uh, every time I see him, I think my drawer, I cannot close because I have too many shirts inside. Um, and if um, you ever think that America has um, got something wrong with it, just go out away for a few weeks because this country is not a real place. The rest of the world is a, is a real place and the, this world will, will um, this America, we, we have more debt than they do, so we can do it. But we're not any richer than they are in a way, I, I don't know. Uh, this is a Cambodian Chinese funeral. You see the twin girls there uh, and their little brother. They shaved their head as a sign of mourning. See, he's got his hand in his face there. And these are all dear friends of ours. And um, she died of cancer so quickly, the mother, that people thought she was cursed. So they would not help the family get her ready for burial. So Stephanie and I had to do it. Uh, studying the Bible in, in homes. Um, this is Thierry, uh, a faithful church member. Um, her family situation is no good, so we have helped her make a house. This is the kitchen that uh, I made for her, um, and I made the counter short enough for her. Um, and I would love to tell you more about these people, but um, you'll have to hear about that in the AFM magazine. So you, you have seen a few of them. And um, this is someone's house that was a church member that lived alone. All of her family died during the killing fields. She was the only one left. And her house was in a hole in someone's rice field. She, she didn't have any of her own land. They said, you can, you can live there. And uh, it, the water was so deep that when we would visit her, she had tied a wooden bed in the rafters of the house and put all her stuff there and her feet were just hanging in the water. And so we went to a group of men playing volleyball nearby. And when the game was over, I said, okay, everybody, I need your help. And they all came and they carried her house onto the street and we put uh, 300 dump truck loads of fill dirt in for her. And then we put her house there and then uh, it's above the ground now. Uh, this is my wife when she, was tired one day, some of her friends said, lay down here and we'll give you a back rub. The um, national tree of Cambodia is the palm tree, uh, that's the sugar palm, and they get sugar from there. There's my son with some of his friends. And this is in our home, this is our front yard. Um, when we're having family worship, sometimes the neighbor kids are looking by the in through the window. And when they see that I notice them, then they run away. And eventually I call to them and say, you don't have to be afraid. You can come in and, and join us. And sometimes we have a, a group there um, and we don't have stories in their language, but they see the pictures. And the Mary and the women in the blue Bible stories, they have similar head coverings and dresses to them. They say, oh, that we can relate to those people. Anyway, um, we want to keep in touch with you and we want to I'll tell you as, as the progress goes with uh, each of these people and um, we'll have a reunion in heaven and um, you can, you can um, keep us in your prayers and thank you for supporting us. Um, may we all hear well done, good and faithful servant uh, one day. Um, I, I um, praise God that our daughter's passport came in the mail this week. They said it would take 18 weeks. It only took 10. And we're, our next step is to buy tickets and then spend a family vacation together in a hotel room for 14 days. Um, so pray, pray for us. My wife is not too excited about it. I've traveled so much on furlough. I think I'm looking forward to it. Just um, anyway, our closing hymn is... Um, Lord, I want to be a Christian is 319. One thing I learned in my time of ministry was you can study the Bible with people, but what they, how they know that you're a Christian 
is being more loving to them. And I just want to encourage you all to have Jesus as your example in, in loving those around you because what, how your life is is the ministry that you have. And, and um, please, uh, please enjoy the, the last hymn, Lord, I want to be a Christian. So please turn, open your hymnals and turn to number 319, 319. Lord, I want to be a Christian. this report that we've just heard, the work that's being done uh, clear across the globe there in Cambodia. We continue to ask a blessing over Joshua and his, his family. We know there are a few obstacles uh, getting back, and we just pray that your hand be in, in all of that and that your will be done. May they continue to bear fruit uh, from their labor. We're excited to hear about four precious souls, one for the kingdom, and we pray for many more. This is our prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. <laughs> 